partner, Jose Polito. So usually we'll have our first year start off with the imaging conference, but we're gonna have another institution bring in some other ideas and uh, other cases from Singapore. So we're gonna have some of our Singaporean friends join in today. Uh, I'm gonna have Jose Polito give a little enlightenment on their institution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sivalingham. Um, this is exciting because um, uh, Wills has been uh, at the forefront here uh, with the Retina Imaging Conference for several years, bringing uh, Will's retina to the world. And this way we bring the world to Will's retina as well. So we're going to try this. Um, and uh, we're starting with um, National University of Singapore um, and National University Hospital Department of Ophthalmology who are close friends and uh, research collaborators. And uh, we're going to uh, listen to a couple of cases from them and a little bit about their institution. But first, we'll start with the case from Wills. Dr. Light. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Polito, Dr. Sibilingham. Uh, we'll get started. So the uh, first case that I have for you is a 50-year-old male who was referred to the retina service clinic from the Will's Eye uh, ER after he had presented there four days after incidentally noticing uh, he had poor vision in his right eye with uh, cross cover. Uh, Dr. Shalai. So we have a pseudo color white field on this photo of the right eye. This is the affected eye with 2400 vision or the discovered eye. Uh, the media appears clear. The disc has a sharp margin to it. The rims look healthy. There appears to be an abnormal vessel on the inferior aspect here, possibly a collateral vessel. And looking further at the retinal vasculature, our attention is drawn to this asymmetry between the superior and inferior aspect of the retina. There's a lot of attenuation of both the arteries and also the veins as well, especially the veins. There's this kind of drastic tapering from here distally in the inferior aspect of the retina. But the vasculature do appear tortuous and relatively attenuated for someone who's 50. Um, we can also notice this pigmentary change corresponding to the areas that we have the attenuation. And also in the central macula, this halo of pigmentary change as well, um, accounting somewhat for the decreased vision there. As far as the visualized periphery, uh, there's some areas of white without pressure nasally here. And in the temporal aspect, there are these patches of what appears to be deep, distinct hypopigmentation. Yeah, excellent summary. Just to give a little bit closer look at that macular lesion. Yeah, so this gives us a little more detail here. So again, we can appreciate this collateral vessel and in the inferior aspect of the disc. Also in the macula itself, uh, that pigmentary change, that halo, that blunted foveal reflex that we were noticing earlier, and the inferior pigmentary change, as well as we can appreciate some uh, AV changes here, some nicking, as well as some um, potentially copper wiring as well along the arterioles and the tortuosity of the vessels. And again, that striking difference between the inferior and superior vasculature in terms of the caliber and also the tortuosity of the overall vasculature. Agreed. So same imaging modality in the left eye, we have 2050 vision. Again, the media appears clear, the disc sharp margins. Um, once again, we notice this abnormal vessel, hard to say here if it's a true collateral versus maybe a pre-retinal uh, loop. Um, the rim appears healthy. Once again, we do have this tortuosity of the vasculature, both arteries and veins. And uh, similarly, though less distinct, there is some attenuation of the vasculature and in the inferior aspect relative to the superior aspect of the retina. The macula itself has a less blunted reflex to it, but given the 2050 vision and there may be some changes to the central macula. And a zoomed in image here also, we appreciate that vascular anomaly here on the disc. Um, 
the patient does seem to have a ciliaretinal artery just based on the architecture of the vessel here. And we also appreciate some uh, maybe dot blot hemorrhages, possibly microaneurysms as well in the macula. And once again, we see the tortuosity of the vasculature, both arteries and veins, and attenuated appearance of the vasculature in the <clears throat> inferior macula. Great. White field fundus autofluorescence of the right eye. Um, our attention here is drawn to areas that corresponded to the pigmentary change on the color photos. Here we see them as patches of hypo autofluorescence, uh, maybe some stippling hyper autofluorescence intervening in the inferior macula here. And in that area where we were seeing that halo of um, pigmentary change, we see it's distinctly hypo autofluorescent in the central macula here. Um, once again, the distribution is pretty hemispheric here, so mostly the inferior retina is involved. We can almost like draw an oblique line coursing through the nerve and the central macula here with the pathology. And that area of pigmentary change in the deep choroid is hyper autofluorescent on this imaging in the far periphery in the temporal area. Same imaging modality of the left eye um, here less drastic of changes, but we do see some foci of um, hypo autofluorescence corresponding to those maybe dot blot hemorrhages or microaneurysms we were seeing previously. There's one here temporally. Once again, the distribution seems to be predominantly inferior, and we also have some changes, hypofluorescence or hypo autofluorescence uh, in the macula here as well, maybe justifying some of the vision change. So we have a raster horizontal OCT uh, going through the right fovea here. On the infrared image, we again appear this stippled um, reflectance change in the inferior macula relative to the superior macula, and we see it corresponds to the atrophic changes we're seeing on the B scan. Once again, we notice that halo here as well, and corresponding it to the B scan itself, we see that there's marked attenuation of the outer retinal laminations. There's almost complete loss of the ellipsoid zone, uh, external limiting membrane uh, in the central macula and subfoveal here. Uh, there is some hypertrophy of the RPE as well there, and some increased signal um, because of the atrophy there. The inner retinal laminations itself appear somewhat less involved, and there's this accentuation of the um, the foveal contour probably owning to the uh, atrophy of the outer retinal layers. The vitreous is optically clear. There's a trace ERM here, and the choroidal vasculature appears relatively normal. Mm -hmm. So we have a cut through the inferior macula here, and uh, somewhat similar findings, not surprising based on what we were seeing on the OMFOS images, but there's distortion of the retinal architecture. We actually appreciate it both in the inner and outer retinal layers here complete loss of the ellipsoid zone, uh, external limiting membrane, and some focal areas of uh, RPE hypertrophy, possible early migration, corresponding to those pigmentary changes we were seeing. Once again, a trace ERM here, a vitreous clear, choroid also looks normal. And stark difference with the superior macula cut that we see here. He here we have a relatively normal appearance of the retinal laminations, both inner and outer maybe some early changes in the outer retinal layers here, uh, ellipsoid zone and external limiting membrane perhaps. Again, that trace ERM once more and the vitreous and choroid look good. So again, clear asymmetry between the superior and inferior Definitely. areas of the macula. So same imaging modality in the left eye. Again, uh, raster horizontal OCT going through the left fovea. Um, here we appreciate the changes mostly in the central macula. Uh, that blunted reflex that we were seeing previously does correspond to some macular edema, intraretinal fluid. There is some thickening of the inner retina, especially nasally, that we appreciate here. There are some early changes of the outer retinal architecture as well, some loss of the ellipsoid zone focally here. Um, and once again, the vitreous looks normal and the choroid has a normal appearance. The hyaloid appears to be down on this side. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so cut through the inferior macula. Once again, we see the hyaloid face, some focal areas of traction. The corridor architecture appears intact, and the retinal laminations here on this cut look normal, maybe just a little bit distorted from that focal traction from the hyaloid. And then the superior macula on this side um, looks relatively normal with the architecture. Mm -hmm. So white field fluorescein angiogram, 17 seconds in the left eye. We're in the arterial phase. We're starting to get some laminar flow in the superior aspect here, but no flow through the veins. So we could call it a delayed AV transit time, at least in the inferior aspect of the retina here. And that vessel that we thought was a ciliaretinal artery is indeed lighting up fairly early. So probably does correspond to the ciliaretinal artery. At 43 seconds, full venous phase, uh, we're getting perfusion of the veins here completely. Um, our attention is drawn to these foci of hyperfluorescence, again, mostly in the inferior retina and respecting this line that we can draw here in the middle. Uh, they appear to be corresponding to microaneurysm. We'll, we'll see how they behave later on. But again, we appreciate the tortuosity of the vasculature and especially the veins here inferiorly, maybe some early microvascular changes in the interface. The disc itself looks OK. So uh, here we are at the AV phase in the right eye, 1 minute, 15 seconds. Again, we have full perfusion of the arteries and veins here. Our attention is drawn to hyperfluorescence in the inferior macula, where we were seeing the pigmentary change, as well as that halo we were noticing previously, as well as these foci of hyperfluorescence that we can appreciate. Once again, it's mostly in the inferior retina. There are some foci of hyperfluorescence superiorly here as well. So this could be a you know, window defect or staining. There was atrophy. But we'll, again, we'll see how it behaves later on. Yeah, I think one could maybe argue that the fundus looks a little bit extorted. So kind of determining the superior versus inferior might be a little bit skewed as right, well. Right, it's a little oblique. Right, yeah. yeah. So late phase uh, angiogram in the left eye. And here we see the changes, uh, the hyperfluorescent changes corresponding to leakage uh, around those areas that we were suspecting of microaneurysm. So once again, they do respect uh, a clear line here, mostly inferiorly. And uh, the disc looks normal. Similar appearance in the right eye. Again, somewhat increased hyperfluorescence, but this is more consistent with a staining pattern and possibly window defect in the central macula. Yeah, agreed. So what, uh, what do you think this could be? Yeah, so this looks more like a retinal vascular etiology um, in a patient who has evidence of potentially collateral formation, the tortuosity of the vasculature, those microaneurysmal formations. I would be suspicious for a retinal vein occlusion. Um, possibly sequential in this case. In the right eye, it did appear a little older, and it was discovered incidentally, so a vein occlusion. Whenever I think about vein occlusions, especially bilateral, hyperviscosity syndrome is on the differential, though it's fairly asymmetric in the superior and inferior retina. I've never really seen hyperviscosity present like that, um, though it could be on the differential, and we could investigate that. Um, a radiation retinopathy coming from potentially like an inferior source and just focally affecting the retina um, may do something like that. So I would inquire about history of head and neck radiation, maybe chest radiation. Um, it's fairly unusual and abnormal for hypertensive or diabetic retinopathy to do that, again, just based on the asymmetry that's present in each eye. But I would put that on the differential as well. And then leukemic and anemic retinopathy could cause changes like that, though, again, the asymmetry is pretty striking here. Yeah, that's a very good list, pretty comprehensive. I uh, agree that uh, the things you mentioned in, uh, with RVO, I think, being firmly at the top top of the, uh, the list here. Uh, we also thought CSCR maybe just given the chronic pigmentary changes. But again, we wouldn't expect to see all those vascular abnormalities. So some pertinent history from this patient. Um, he does have end-stage renal disease and is on hemodialysis, so a fairly uh, uh, sick, sick individual. 
uh, who has established history of poorly controlled hypertension, his systolic's routinely running uh, from 180 to even over 200. Uh, he also has a non-insulin dependent diabetes. Um, last A1C was actually pretty good, 5.6%. Uh, he's a non-smoker. He does have chronic anemia on iron supplementation, likely related to his chronic renal disease. And he was actually seen in the emergency department a couple of years prior, and at that time was diagnosed with bilateral inferior HRVOs, visual acuity, in particular in that right eye, was quite good <laughs> at uh, 2025. But unfortunately, uh, the patient was lost to follow up. <clears throat> So branch retinal vein occlusions, which is, we agree, we feel is the most likely uh, explanation, uh, especially in light of all of his systemic uh, comorbidities. Uh, this condition was first reported by Labor in 1877, uh, and the Beaver Dam Eye study showed a 0.6% prevalence uh, when looking at kind of cross-sectional data. The kind of classic risk factors that are described uh, include hypertension, high cholesterol, uh, known cardiovascular disease, um, open angle glaucoma is an association we've all uh, known about and is a, kind of interesting as to why that might be uh, associated. Um, actually, Asian and Hispanic ethnicity has also been shown in some reports uh, to have to carry a higher risk of, of BRVO, uh, as well as a high uh, body mass uh, index. Um, there have also been independent reports that just show a well, uh, a, a well demonstrated association with um, chronic kidney disease, though obviously many of these comorbidities are also present in patients with, with chronic kidney disease. Talking briefly about the pathogenesis of BRVO, um, it's felt to in, uh, focus on the kind of turbulent flow that is caused at the junction of uh, artery and venous crossings. The idea being that that turbulent flow can predispose to the generation of uh, thrombosis uh, within the vein and then subsequent occlusion of the, the distal uh, venous system. The association with hypertension uh, is often believed to be because the arteries and the veins share an adventitial sheath together that the thickening and sclerosis, or I should say, or the hardening of the arterial wall may cause, uh, and given the limited real estate within that sheath, may cause a particular compression of the venous system, which has a less uh, robust uh, vascular wall. There was an interesting paper that came out in 2019 that actually looked in detail using uh, OCT imaging at these arterial venous crossings. Uh, and they were able to identify uh, examples of both the arterial overcrossing and venous overcrossing, and actually studied some of the uh, differential characteristics between these two. Um, you can see with the yellow arrows in the, uh, the mock-up, the schematic that uh, reflects what is seen in the actual uh, B-scan image, uh, the yellow arrowheads correspond to the clots uh, within the, the venous system. Um, and then the uh, red uh, arrows correspond to the arteries uh, and the typical uh, reflectance pattern that we see from those vessels. And then the blue arrowheads uh, correspond to the, the walls of, of the vein. Uh, they found that actually venous overcrossings were associated with more severe areas of non-perfusion. Um, and it was hypothesized that this may have to do with maybe even the uh, interaction between the vein and the internal limiting membrane, that when, a arteri uh, when an artery is underneath the vein pushing up on it, that the compression between that artery and the ILM may be one reason why the, the, the compression could be more, more severe and maybe the non-perfusion that results um, worse. This then brings up another question, especially in this patient. You know, I think one could make an argument that his right eye, at least, where you see that really clear involvement of the inferior uh, hemisphere, that this could be a hemispheric retinal vein occlusion. And you know, it's been raised in the past, you know, is this truly a distinct entity? Is it more like a CRVO? Is it more like a BRVO? Um, and so some, some individuals have looked at this in the past. The SCORE trial um, actually did comment on this. Uh, they found that HRVOs tended to be kind of in the middle in terms of the area of retinal thickening and FA leakage on, on imaging studies that were done during that trial. Uh, and they also concluded that the response to therapy of an HRVO tended to be more akin to that of a BRVO rather than a CRVO. 
Uh, this paper by Sanborn and uh, McGargle uh, from the 80s actually uh, compared uh, hemispheric uh, retinal uh, vein occlusion characteristics to central and branch. Um, and you can see hemisphere kind of sits in the middle with regard to patients who have good visual acuity for the patients who do not have good visual acuity, uh, and then those who end up going on to develop NVI and NVG. That's, that paper came from Wills. It did, indeed. Larry McGargle was the head of the retinovascular department. Right, right, Bill Benson? Of right. uh, the retina service, yeah. So, you know, the other question that sometimes comes up is, well, when we are talking about an HRVO, what, what is the pathology? Um, and some have used the terms hemispheric versus hemicentral retinal vein occlusion. The hemicentral being some individuals have dual uh, central retinal vein trunks within the, um, within the optic nerve. Um, and there's, it, the question has been raised whether or not occlusion of one of those is a different sort of pathology than occlusion of a branch that comes out right from the disc uh, itself leading to the, the HRVO. Um, though the, nothing has really borne out um, regarding that, that difference. And in fact, um, most people do not consider them to be different pathological entities, partially because it's very difficult to tell just looking at, at fluorescein. A little bit quickly about the treatment of branch uh, vein occlusions. Uh, the classic study is the BVOS study, which found that grid laser uh, was successful in uh, increasing the proportion of patients who gained two or more lines of visual uh, acuity. The SCORE trial looked at the use of triamcinolone uh, to treat these uh, conditions, uh, with the standard of care being the grid laser that was mentioned prior, um, and actually did not find any significant benefit over laser uh, with the use of uh, triamcinolone. And then what we all kind of base our treatment decisions on now uh, really comes from the BRAVO trial with the advent of anti-VEGF. And you can see in, in this trial a uh, clear uh, benefit in, in regards to improvement in vision uh, with both ranamizabab at 0.3 and 0.5 uh, milligrams uh, compared to sham injection, with the sham group, once they started to receive injections, uh, catching up, though, in, in a delayed fashion. So just a couple lingering questions. You know, why the focal subfovial atrophy OD? I mean, I, I thought it was likely from chronic edema that we just simply have not seen since the patient was lost to follow-up. Does anyone disagree with that or think there could be another etiology? No, I think that's right. You know, just chronic, untreated edema eventually will go away, and then you have atrophy of the photoreceptor cells over a long period of time. Usually it has to be pretty and, and severe. Not, and to... non-perfusion also, mm -hmm. probably. Usually it has to be pretty severe to get the foveal RPE changes in um, chronic edema. Um, I think I recall you saying that the presentation in the ER, the vision was 2025, so Correct. it must have worsened at some point thereafter. Yeah, agreed. And so because of that fact, would you treat the edema in the left eye aggressively? He's 2050, which is actually stable from his initial presentation. There's those little cystic changes, but still uh, preserved fo foveal contour. Would you go after it aggressively, given the findings in the right eye, or would you hold off? I think there's um, room for improvement here, if it's his better CNI now, too, in particular. Um, he'd benefit from treatment to try to get that better. I wouldn't be opposed to treating. Yeah, and we did ultimately decide to treat, um, especially given the course of the of the right eye. All right. The uh, the one other point also regarding the anatomy, I think Jay Duca showed it thirty years ago. The artery is on top of the vein when he looked at it ana anatomically. So two thirds of the vein occlusion branch vein occlusion, arteries on top, and then the other third of vein is on top. But from what you're telling me, the vein is a little worse based on recent uh, studies that because the non-perfusion are worse. Well, that and actually they also propose that if you look at it via OCTA imaging, the number of occlusion points, the amount of arterial overcrossings and venous overcrossings actually start to approach each other. So the the venous overcrossings may be underestimated. That was what the their what they proffered based on their OCTA uh, analysis. What's the incidence of artery on top versus vein on top in the general population? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. If you don't have that information, head. then the fact that it's more common when the artery's on top doesn't tell you anything. Correct. All right. Thanks very much. Good morning. My name is Hui Wen, and today I'll be sharing a case with you from the Kent University Hospital where I'm currently. and the left eye was reasonably good at 0.8. Sit-down examination showed mild nucleus chirosis but was otherwise unremarkable. Other pictures of both eyes show multifocal, fluffy, creamy, yellowish, choroidal lesions, diffusely located in the posterior pole. The largest lesions in both eyes were located superior temporally, with the left eye lesion being larger than the right. Hint of hemorrhage within these lesions and pigment alteration can be appreciated. In the right eye, there's also loss of the central fovea reflex as well as possible retinal folds seen inferior to the fovea suggestive of presence of subretinal fluid. The extent of the subretinal fluid can be better appreciated in both eyes with the fundus autofluorescence images. These are OCT cuts of the superior temporal lesion in the right eye. The top image cuts right through the center of that lesion, and there's clear evidence of irregular elevation of the RPE, subretinal fluid. Right over the center, there is altered reflectivity, suggestive of possibly the hemorrhage that we saw within the lesion in the fundus photo. The bottom image is the most inferior aspect of that lesion, again showing a dome-shaped configuration with serious detachment that extends towards the fovea. Similar cuts taken over the superior temporal lesion in the left eye shows similar changes. The bottom image is that of the inferior edge of the lesion, and we can see a plateau configuration of RPE elevation. These lesions were hypofluorescent on ICG and much more extensive with smaller lesions seen far into the periphery. The differentials considered at this point included choroidal metastasis, either from the lung or breast, multiple myeloma, choroidal lymphoma. Inflammatory lesions were deemed unlikely in the absence of any inflammation. The patient's past medical history was significant for ovarian cysts which were removed laparoscopically and shown to be benign. She is on oral contraceptive pill. Review of system was unremarkable, and the patient is a non-smoker. As part of the workup, urgent PET-CT was arranged. These are the images of the patient. There is extensive multi-organ involvement, including the right upper lung lobe, supraclavicular, mediastinal, and hyalur lymph nodes, adrenal gland, as well as the bone. Given the PET-CT finding, there was a high suspicion for metastatic lung adenocarcinoma. The patient underwent ultrasound-guided transbronchial needle aspiration. Several lymph nodes were biopsied, which were positive for lung adeno-CA. This was further confirmed on bone marrow biopsy. Additionally, the patient was also tested for mutation in the EGFR gene, which showed a deletion in exon 19. And this mutation is associated with improved sensitivity to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which is one of the treatment for non-small cell lung cancer. The patient was started on osimatinib, which is also known as Tegreso, a third generation irreversible EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor. This is now the first line for EGFR mutation positive advanced non-small cell lung cancer. A large multi-center study reviewing the overall survival of patients with previously untreated EGFR-mutated 
advanced non-small cell lung cancer treated with either osimertinib or an older generation EGFR TKI showed that with osimertinib, the median overall survival was significantly better at 38.6 months and similar side effect profile was seen in both categories. I'd like to just briefly review uveal metastasis. Uveal tract is the most common ophthalmic site for hematogenous spread of metastatic cancer. The mean age at ocular diagnosis is usually around 60 years of age, and there's a slightly greater female preponderance. Most cases are unilateral, and the top two primary sites will be breast followed by lung. Overall survival is very much dependent on the primary site of the tumor. Generally speaking, primaries arising from the lung, GI tract, thyroid, kidney, and pancreas confer a poorer prognosis. In a paper published by Dr. Shields and team, looking at close to 200 patients with lung cancer and uveal metastasis from the Wills Eye Hospital at Emory University, showed a 54% mortality at a one-year follow-up. 44% of these patients were unaware of the diagnosis of lung cancer at the time of detection of the uveal metastasis, and the primary malignancy was only discovered after uveal metastasis was detected. Therefore, as ophthalmologists, we play an important role in the management of such patients, and we must always maintain a low index of suspicion, as not all cases will present with lesions as extensive as those seen in this patient. And such patients should be managed with a multidisciplinary approach. Thank you for that great case. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Dunn, wh when you see a, a, uh, a patient with multifocal choroidal lesions, you know, we want to sort out in our head, is this VKH or an inflammatory condition versus is this, you know, a metastatic condition? And were there any tips on the OCT? I mean, the subretinal fluid looked a little dirty here. Whenever I see dirty subretinal fluid, I start to think of inflammatory conditions more so than metastatic conditions. Do you have any comments on that? Well, sometimes you can distinguish just based on the clinical history. <clears throat> so the patient didn't have any symptoms of VKH, which is a you know, clinical diagnosis. There's no lab testing for VKH. Um, certainly, uh, tuberculosis would be in that differential as sort of the kind of a variant of the tuberculous serpiginous choroidopathy it'd be much less likely to get um, cortical neovascularization with that um, and the hemorrhages, but any inflammatory condition that affects the RPE might do that. Um, I'd get syphilis testing. Um, you know, if the patient were younger, didn't have any other symptoms, you could think about some of the white dot syndromes like uh, AMPI, um, but again, the, the clinical course didn't fit with that. So yeah, you need to consider inflammatory conditions, but you can often rule those out either on the medical history or just on serologic testing. Carol, a quick question. On the OCT, can you tell the difference between metastatic versus inflammatory based on the thickness? I mean, if you have a lesion that's you know five millimeters in thickness, you're leaning much more towards a neoplastic condition. But in this case, the lesions were actually very, you know, pretty thin. They could be imaged on OCT. And they did show that characteristic lumpy, bumpy appearance that we see with metastatic foci. But I have to say, nothing's pathognomonic. So I would expect with a, a VKH, that's kind of a chronic VKH, you might see a little bit of a lumpy, bumpy appearance too. But when we see lumpy, bumpy appearance to the surface of the choroid, we start to think of metastatic tumors. Uh, lymphoma can do that to some extent. Uveal effusion can do that. And I would think some inflammatory conditions can do that. And uh, I congratulate the, uh, the team from Ghent because they did, they did what I was worried about. They got a chest x-ray, uh, especially in a, in a patient who's a non-smoker. Don't let the fact that she's a non-smoker sway you against getting a chest x-ray. And chest x-ray and PET scan confirm, you know, multiple uh, sites of involvement. If there, if there weren't other sites of involvement, one thing that could be done in a case like this, as long as, 
you know, uveitis rules out a UV, you know, a uveitis in the eye is we could do a fine needle aspiration biopsy of one of the larger lesions and hopefully establish the diagnosis. Uh, they did say that the lab tests for inflammatory lesions were done, but it was negative. Yeah. Yeah, that's, in a case like this, I would have asked that to be done, it just because it wasn't quite, I mean, it's multifocal lesions, uh, but the, it's, I don't, I forget the age of the patient, but the patient was a non-smoker. If the patient was a smoker, I would have gone right to uh, chest x-ray. And the other thing you want to do in these patients is also do a breast exam. Once every blue moon, we see a neglected breast cancer that presents with metastatic disease. We just had one a few, like two months ago. What about the hemorrhage? Does that point you one way or the other? Pretty rare to get hemorrhage over metastatic tumors. Pretty rare. It might suggest that it's a fast-growing tumor or one that may have caused a little break in Brooks membrane. We don't often see that. Let's go to the next case. The introduction. It is a pleasure to introduce you to the Department of Ophthalmology and National University Hospital and Yong Lin School of Medicine, National University of Singapore. My name is Victor, and I'll spend the next five minutes to give you an overview of the ophthalmology department's vision, mission, and areas of focus on the three pillars of an academic medical center that is clinical, research, and education domains. The vision of the department is to be a center of excellence by providing the best tertiary level clinical services, highly regarded training and education programs, and world leading translation research. Our mission is to advance eye health by synergizing care, education, and research in partnership with patients and the community. This is an aerial photo of the Academic Medical Center and National University Health System. To your left, is the main hospital which was started in 1985 as Singapore's first public restructured hospital. The hospital sees about 1 million patients every year and considers itself as an academic health institute. To your right is the Yongbu Lin School of Medicine, which is also one of Asia's leading medical school and also the oldest medical school in Singapore, established in 1905. At the moment, there are nine translational research programs that are cross-disciplinary in nature. This includes digital medicine and artificial intelligence, precision medicine, and synthetic biology. The ophthalmology department is embedded within both the multidisciplinary setup of a tertiary referral hospital and a university environment that is focused on translational research. At the moment, the senior permanent staff consists 26 professionals across the whole range of subspecialty in ophthalmology, including glaucoma, medical and surgical retina, cornea refractory surgery, pediatric ophthalmology, neuro ophthalmology, oculoplastics, and comprehensive ophthalmology. We also have an active five year residency program that are broadly divided into residents and senior residents. The clinical service is also supported by a group of senior resident physicians. Under the clinical domain, there is a full service department offering a complete range of ophthalmic subspecialties that covers both adults and children. We are also one of Singapore's major ophthalmology tertiary referral center. On an annual basis, we experience close to 90,000 attendees at our outpatient clinics and around 10,000 ophthalmic surgeries. Some unique niche services include the Inherited Retina Degeneration Clinic and the Ophthalmic Oncology Service. We focus on two main pigs of excellence for research and innovation. In the glaucoma domain lies novel medical technologies in community-based diagnostics, innovation in glaucoma therapeutics, and data-centric analytics. In the retina domain, we focus on retina translational and therapeutics, large collaborative studies, and pharmaceutical or industry-initiated trials. Last but not the least, the department has a strong and rich culture in teaching and training the next generation of doctors. 
The residency program started in 2010, and this is a five-year program that provides close monitoring by our core faculty. The undergraduate program has evolved to embrace technology and is responsible for close to 300 medical students every year. The department welcomes international fellows who are keen on subspecialty training, especially in glaucoma, retina, oculoplastics, and neuro-ophthalmology. That gives a quick overview of the ophthalmology department. I would like to end this presentation by sincerely welcoming you to join us in January 2022 for this virtual meeting to celebrate our 36th anniversary for the ophthalmology department at National University Hospital. Very good morning. My name is Wendy Wong. I'm with the Medical Retina Service at NUH. It's a pleasure to be presenting today. Our patient is a 27-year-old Chinese gentleman. Considering his young age, he has undergone quite a few surgeries, starting with a craniectomy at the age of nine, followed by repeated excisions of lumps on his chest wall as a teenager. He recently underwent excision of two lumps on his right thigh with a larger lesion measuring 11 centimeters in size. The histology returned as superficial angiomyxomas. He was brought to the emergency department by his girlfriend when she discovered that he had sudden difficulty with word finding. He was then transferred to our center for a stroke activation. The patient also complained of blurring of vision in his left eye and was referred to our service. In the emergency department, these were his recorded visual acuities. He is a low myope and wasn't wearing his glasses. He was found to have a left relative apron pupillary defect. These photos were taken two days after his presentation on a Saturday. In the left eye, we can see that there's extensive areas of retinal whitening along the temporal arcades. There's also an area of whitening over the papillomacular macular bundle, and it's a little bit more subtle, but there were changes in the supranasal retina as well. This is a magnified view of the multiple branch retinal artery occlusions, and on the OCT, we can see that he was very fortunate and the fovea was just spared. Above that, you can see classical changes in a retinal artery occlusion with increased reflectivity involving the inner retina, which masks the reflectivity from the outer retina. Given that he had multiple branch retinal artery occlusions with altered mental status, the differentials that were considered were Susak syndrome, vasculitis, as well as a cardioembolic phenomenon. He underwent fundus fluorescein angiography, and as we can see, there was marked delay in filling of the branch retinal arteries with extensive capillary non perfusion. There were also segmental areas of vessel staining, and temporally, we see an area of hyperfluorescence that increases in the late phase. On close scrutiny, we can see that the retinal vessels traverse this area, and this is likely to be leakage from the choroidal vessels. His condition continued to evolve, and we see that he developed purpurate lesions over his hands and feet, and a few fingers also started to turn dusky. What clinched the diagnosis was the 2D echocardiogram, which revealed a large atrial myxoma. For the altered mental status, he was only able to undergo a CT brain because his metal implants were not MRI compatible. There was an incidental finding of a right skull vault lesion. He underwent an audiometry to work up the Susak syndrome, and for his blood tests, we can see that there was mild elevation of inflammatory markers on the background of recent surgery. His autoantibodies and infective screen were otherwise unremarkable. He was started on topical bromonidin, as well as lifelong aspirin by the cardiologist. He was seen by a geneticist who deemed that he fulfilled the diagnostic criteria for Carney's complex. He subsequently underwent open heart surgery and two tumors were resected. A few words on Carney's complex. This is a rare autosomal dominant condition. It can arise from de novo mutations and the gene that is implicated involves the protein kinase A. This complex is characterized by multiple pigmented mucocutaneous lesions, myxomas, and endocrine tumors. We would like to discuss a few points for this case. Firstly, whether or not to perform an anterior chamber paracentesis. In this case, a decision was made not to perform an AC tap because his phobia was deemed to be just sped. 
Regarding the imaging, we have a few questions. Firstly, what accounts for the leakage from the corridor vessels? And secondly, what explains the altered reflectivity on, in the outer nuclear layer on the OCT scans? Thank you very much for your kind attention. Does anybody uh, have any? I was thinking that there was probably a Malrix triangle in Farks, but uh, does anybody want to? add to that or and how about the outer nuclear layer were you thinking of a pam lesion or well again if there were uh, it could be pam or it could be if there were choroidal infarcts um, um, secondary to that Aaron? yeah I, I, I can't expand more than that um, i mean without the i mean Without the history of the myxoma, there could have been other sources, right? Like trauma, um, pancreatitis. I mean, it presented like a purchase type retinopathy, I assume. But I, I, I you know, the the um, triangular appearance sure looks like an amalric triangle. Right. So I, I'd like to ask Dr. Polito. Dr. Carney was from the Mayo Clinic, right? I think so. Yeah, and he described this in the, at the Mayo Clinic. We had a case here at Wills maybe eight to ten years ago where our own Dr. Jackie Carrasco biopsied a lid lesion on a young man that proved to be a myxoma. And very smartly, and rightly so, she sent that patient for evaluation for Carney's complex and found an atrial myxoma. She saved his life. I think any time you find a cutaneous myxoma, or you have someone who has a lot of freckling on the skin, you've got to rule out Carney's complex as, as well as other conditions um, like Pooch Jager and um, xeroderma pigmentosum. We had a case recently that proved to be xeroderma pigmentosum, but Carney complex was in the differential. And they mentioned that uh, the genetic mutation that is pretty specific for Carney complex, uh, that's important to keep in mind. I think we're good.